on the job, part of the present. We can't do it without them. And part of our future. So are we in the middle or at the beginning of a robot revolution? I, I think you could term it that way. By 2050, you have robot co-workers in all shapes and sizes doing all sorts of jobs. Working robots, how they're changing our world now and what it means for your future. Next on Earth 2050. How's it going everybody? My name is Joe Penna and I'm your host for Exploration Earth 2050. In this episode we're going to take a look at robots. All kinds from space robots to factory robots. This is an unbelievably exciting time in human history because we're in the middle of a robotic revolution. And no one knows where we'll end up. So what exactly is a robot? There's no easy answer but they all have a few things in common. They all have sensors. For instance, this NASA robot has a sense of touch and can close its hand in response to feeling pressure. All robots move. They all have some sort of energy, either battery, electrical, or solar power. Welcome to Earth 2050. And they all have some form of intelligence. It's seeing things, it's sensing things, it's deciding what to do about those things, and then it does it. A robot might be tied down and assemble a car, or it might be flying around taking pictures of a rainforest. In the 1950s, we believed that powerfully sophisticated robots were right around the corner. But it didn't happen. Not because we haven't been able to construct them. We can all kinds, and for all different purposes. Here. From kicking a soccer ball, hey. Good job. to spying from the sky, to gathering soil on Mars. The problem has been developing what we call robotic intelligence. For all their hype, robots currently have the brain power of a primitive animal. They're as good as bugs or some of the smaller animals. It's kind of funny because robots can beat human beings at chess or Othello or, or, or checkers, but robots are really, really bad at getting a joke. But things are changing fast. And some believe that within 25 years, robots will have consciousness and think like humans. The amount of processing power in a little smartphone is doubling every 18 months. And it's done that based on something called Moore's Law. And some people are trying to develop artificial intelligence by making the number of circuits inside a box so numerous and so fast that it emulates the number of synapses that flash in a human brain. And at some point, the processing power will exceed all of humanity. And then will we have to start being polite to our refrigerators? Where does it all lead? Will we have robot friends and companions? Will they perform in the arts? It's unknowable. But some scenarios could play out like a science fiction movie. Good morning. There will be machines who will gain some kind of citizenship rights because they'll pass certain types of tests. And if we're smart, we'll welcome them. It's not a science fiction fantasy. Our machines will soon have human-like brain power, consciousness. Our cities, our farms, jobs, and our way of life will never be the same. We're entering a brave new world, and just like the great explorers before us, we have no idea what we'll find. Coming up on Earth 25 miles in altitude, we'll see how robots are helping to explore worlds beyond our own. We're nowhere close to sending humans to Pluto, and we have robots heading to Pluto to take pictures and take samples.
Humanity has long gazed up to the stars and dreamed about discovering new worlds. But leaving Earth's orbit to explore outer space is dangerous. Those journeys can take years and cover billions of miles, ending up in harsh environments. But a powerful alliance is revolutionizing space exploration. Humans are finding that the most indispensable partners in outer space are robots. Lift off of Space Shuttle Atlantis. We want a human space program. We put real human footsteps on Mars, and yet we find more and more that it's our robot emissaries that are able to go farther, cheaper. They're built for space. The robots have the opportunity to go there first before the humans go. They have an opportunity to be there to help the humans, and they ha have an opportunity to be there after the humans have left. It's not a plot for a sci-fi thriller. Robots are already exploring new frontiers. Like Curiosity, the latest in a series of Mars rovers, and the most advanced robot geologist ever made. After a journey of eight and a half months and more than 350 million miles, Curiosity touched down on a two-year mission to search for signs of life. The goal is to follow the water, find out where water existed at what time in the past. Curiosity is a nuclear power monster truck jam-packed with tools to record images and collect and analyze soil and rocks. It's also searching for signs of life. Curiosity's cutting-edge tools include a high-tech infrared laser called CamCam -cam that zaps rocks that analyzes the vapor. Its 17 cameras have already sent tens of thousands of mind-boggling images back to Earth. And this robotic geologist has rocked our planet with evidence that Mars was likely once home to some sort of life. The Curiosity rover is setting the stage for the next step, a manned mission to the Red Planet. Some robots are built specifically to function in alien environments, like Rover and the Amazing Athlete. It's a six-legged, 27-foot high robot that has 48 cameras. Other robots, though, are needed to work with astronauts. Enter the humanoids. Robonaut 2, or R2, has been working with the International Space Station since 2011. It works side by side with crew members and can use tools made for human hands. R2 has more than 350 sensors that let it see and feel its surroundings. It can hold a 20 pound weight with each arm, while tiny sensors in its fingers allow it to grip without crushing. It can be remotely controlled or programmed to carry out tasks by itself. While Robonaut began life at the space station as a torso and couture platform, it now has long, multi-jointed legs, toes that can latch onto things, and cameras in its feet to watch where it's going. With all that engineering, Robonaut is built to lend astronauts a hand by taking on the dangerous and dirty work. Robonaut's there to to help offload uh, human activities so that they can do more complicated tasks and they're not spending their Sunday afternoons wiping down the station. First there was Robonaut, and then Robonaut 2. And now there's Valkyrie, a six foot two robot. Valkyrie is equipped with cameras, sonar, and other sensors from head to toe. And Val is designed to make repairs fast and easy. That's key when you're millions of miles away from the nearest hardware store. And now, a robot spacecraft called New Horizons is going where no one has gone before. Hurtling through space on a 4 billion mile, decade long voyage toward Pluto. We're nowhere close to sending humans to Pluto, and we have robots heading to Pluto to take pictures and take samples. It's a familiar story to send our robots to places too far and too dangerous for us fragile human beings. To let them be our eyes and our ears to the cosmos. All 
of this is made possible by our advancements in robotics. But where does that leave us? When we get out there a hundred years from now, and we have intelligent robots, will they be 90% of the explorers going out there? And will we pout down here on Earth? We invented space flight, now you guys get to go and have all the fun. Next on Earth 2050. How are these rolling boxes changing the workplace? Here, the employees, the work comes to them. The robots bring them the product and they pack it from there. Do you ever wish you lived in a world where robots did all the boring work like washing dishes or cleaning your room so that you can concentrate on the interesting stuff? Guess what? You do. The vacuum cleaner that rolls around the room? That's a robot. The machine on the washroom wall that dries your hand when it senses the motion? That's a robot. That tablet that you're playing games on? Yep, that's a robot too. As we move into the future, more and more robots are taking on the so-called 3D jobs. Jobs that are dirty, dangerous, or just plain dull. Before the shoe company Dansko brought robots into its 200,000 square foot distribution center, an employee might have had to walk six to eight miles each day to fill orders. But now, 46 robots made by a company called Kiva do all the running around. Here, the employees, the work comes to them. The robots bring them the product and they pack it from there. These little robots take orders wirelessly from their operators and use cameras and barcodes on the floor to find their merchandise. And once they locate the goods, they bring it to a human employee to process. And they're not just fast, they're programmed to be highly efficient. Everything they do is choreographed perfectly, like a ballet in orange and blue. Basically, we feed Kiva what we need to pull for our customer orders. Um, and then it, it uses the algorithms and the uh, programming in the robots to then decide uh, the priority or how the shoes get pulled. For a product that is faster moving, the robots know and they keep that product closer to the pulling station so that we can pull the product out quicker. For items that are slower moving, it actually stores them in the back part of the Kiva floor. These robots can lift weights up to 3,000 pounds, but that's not why employers like them so much. The main appeal of these robots is that they do a tough job and they never complain about it. If they do get tired, they just get their batteries recharged and they're right back on the job. We consider them part of our team. They've increased our productivity and increased our customer satisfaction. Are people losing their jobs because of the robots? Absolutely not. We've definitely changed the way people do their job, but we've actually added in employees to our staff. And if you think that working with an army of little orange robots is fun, how about a robot that you can call by name? Meet Baxter, the industrial robot with a face. The reason I'm standing right in between these two robots is to show that they're designed to work with people. There are no sharp objects, they're made with light plastic, and if I accidentally bump into one of them, it'll shut down. Right now, there's less than a thousand in operation, but by the year 2050, who knows how many there will be. Huh? Yeah, I know, I know. Okay, I got this, I got this. Baxter can be kind of pushy, and as I discovered, he has a mind of his own. All right, Baxter, what's that? What are you doing, man? Uh, of course, of course. It's a volcano. Besides his ability to make a baking soda volcano, there's a couple of special things about Baxter. For one, he's smart. Baxter, through vision and through its artificial intelligence, can adapt itself to the environment. So if parts are put down before it, it can find those parts. They don't have to necessarily be in exactly the same place as they were the last time. But better yet, Baxter can learn. There's no real programming, it's more like show and tell. So you show it what to do, you push a button, and it'll remember it. And that means that just about anyone can teach him. How do you move the arm? Okay, so right here at the end, we have a pressure sensor. Just squeeze right here. Squeeze right there. Move the arm around. Oh, yeah. See how easy that is? Yeah. Also, Baxter is more than just a pretty face. You can read him like a book. Facial expressions are easy for anyone to understand. So, normal expression like this, then 
there's nothing wrong. A confused expression is confused. Whenever you touch a button, it'll look in that direction and it'll tilt its eyes towards you. So in a way, it's telling you what it feels. It has emotions. It's kind of, yeah. So it, it allows you to realize what's going on with the robot. Every day, robots are moving into the workplace, taking over repetitive or low-skilled jobs. When we look at Baxter, we're really seeing the baseline or the very beginning of where robotics will go. In the not too distant future, we're all going to become familiar with robots as we interact with them in our everyday lives. And if this is where the future of industrial robotics begins, I better get a picture. Let's take a selfie, yeah? All right, cool. Hello, hire. on Earth 2050. A robot that is changing the way that autistic kids learn. So children respond to Romibo like they would a, a toy or a small pet. Today, is we're gonna learn about Pablo Picasso. Okay, he's a famous painter. At a public library near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, two students sit down for their weekly art class. Color. What we'll do is we'll do one painting on white, one on black. But this isn't your typical educational environment. I like that. Why? Because the person running this class isn't, well, it isn't a person. What is your favorite color? It's a robot. And it's a future of how robots and people work and learn together. Its name is Romibo. Romibo is a socially assistive robot that is being used as a tool by teachers and caregivers to help children with social and emotional disabilities communicate more with other people. Looks great. It's, really it's you great. with the, uh, here's the eyes, here's the two antenna thingies. The children in this class are autistic, a condition that sometimes makes it difficult for them to relate to other people. Children who are overwhelmed by the human interaction, who find human faces, intonations, and body language difficult to read, along with trying to take in verbal information, um, they're relieved of all of that when they work with the robot because the robot gives the verbal information with no voice intonation, no expression, um, so they can really feel very uninhibited and focused when they work with the robot. I like what you did here. But a robot, or at least this robot, is much easier for children to relate to. Tell me a little bit about the design of Romibo. It's, it's very warm, fuzzy, kind of big, right? Right. So children respond to Romibo like they would a, a toy or a small pet. The size is just about their size where they can hug it and play with it like they would a normal toy. Romibo is the opposite of most working robots in factories. Three. Those robots are heavy and usually made of expensive materials. Romibo is made mostly of cheap plastic and can be assembled by anyone. It's built almost as if it were a toy. Yeah, that's but it's really a surprisingly sophisticated communication device. Yes, I like it. The therapist communicates with the students through the robot. Who would you like to draw next? So the therapist is completely in control in the way the robot responds to the child and they're able to guide the robot's interactions based on that child's individual learning needs and goals. One reason why Romibo works so well is because it's so simple. Its only facial expression comes from here. It's two eyes on a smartphone. And its voice, which is controlled by a computer, is always the same. My name is Romibo. <laughs> And so what happens is that the students who often have problems communicating with the teachers find themselves loosening up and relating to this tiny furry robot. Kids will shut down for me. But when that happens, then I can go and still get the result I need via the robot. I'm still controlling it. I'm still using my lesson plans. Some parents have been skeptical about their child interacting with a robot. But many have come to believe that Romibo provides a stepping stone a middle ground to help their children interact better with people. Not only was the robot a lot less threatening to him than a human being, um, he often, you know, he wants to do a good job and please others, but he has difficulty with the, that social interaction. So the robot, he didn't have those worries, is my guess. 
Social therapy robots like Romibo have been around for more than 20 years. The problem is that they cost a lot of money. But Romibo's simplicity has added advantages. It's really easy to build and made of inexpensive materials. Designers want people to be able to buy it off a shelf, just like any other consumer product. We are trying to create a robot that is at a low enough cost that a teacher or a therapist or possibly even parents anywhere would be able to get this robot at an affordable cost. More paper. And that, they say, is the future of working robots. Available to everyone and doing jobs designed specifically for robots, not people. Welcome back to Earth 2050. While doing the story, I had one scientist tell me that the future is robots, more robots, and then even more robots. And almost all of these robots are designed to be on the job. That's even true for a fuzzy little guy like Romibo. What is your favorite color? Green. At, at a certain point, our machines will get in some fashion smarter than us, in some way. And the real question is, we don't know what's going to happen exactly when that happens, but we think some things will get very, very easy. So there's no doubt that by 2050, we'll be dependent on robots for a laundry list of jobs. Speaking of laundry lists, your washer dryer is actually a robot. So is your dishwasher. We've gotten so used to them that we don't think of them that way. For now, I guess I'm happy that they haven't come up with a robot that does my job. Or have they? That's it for this week's show. I'm Romy Bo, and I hope you will join Joe again next time for another edition of Earth 2050. Goodbye. Nice job, Romy Bo. See you later.